نحن نقص عليك أحسن القصص بما أوحينا إليك هذا القرآن وإن كنت من قبله لمن الغافلين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولهم بعد. We are continuing in our uh, stories of the prophets and we're now doing uh, the prophet Adam عليه السلام and in our last lecture uh, we had done the blowing of the ruh into Adam عليه السلام. Now today we're going to move on uh, from that and talk about the next aspect that we know from our tradition and that is Allah's speech to Adam. And uh, we're going to elaborate a little bit about this concept of Allah's speech to Adam and uh, Adam alayhi salam learning uh, this, uh, the speech and learning Allama Adam al Asma kullaha. So uh, we learn from the hadith in the uh, Mustadrak of Al Hakim and also in uh, the Sunan uh, the, of Al Tirmidhi and uh, the Sahih ibn Hibban that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said when the ruh was blown into Adam, uh, it reached his head. And it came down and it came to his nostrils and it tickled his nostrils and so he sneezed. And so Adam alayhi salam sneezed. And without having heard anything, without anybody teaching him anything at this stage, he fitratan, yani his inner instinct, his, his inner nature, he uttered alhamdulillah. Okay, this is a very deep and profound and symbolic uh, point here. And that is that Adam alayhi salam was created, the ruh was created wanting to praise Allah. Where did Adam get this knowledge from? To say Alhamdulillah. Where did the belief even that there is a God and the fact that that God should be praised, where did it come from? It is something that was ingrained in the ruh itself. Adam did not need to be taught of the existence of Allah. He did not need to learn and acquire the knowledge of Allah. He didn't have to do an advanced degree in philosophy to figure out the abstract proofs for the existence of God, which has occupied Western thought and continues to occupy, occupy Western thought up until our times. All of this thrown out the window. He intrinsically knew there is a higher being and that higher being should be praised. So he said, Alhamdulillah. And Therefore, the first words uttered by the first man were our first words of the Qur'an, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. That was the first words uttered by man. And it is befitting that man begins his speech by saying Alhamdulillah. And when Adam alayhi salam said Alhamdulillahi, uh, in, in one version it says Alhamdulillah, and in another version it says Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And this is interesting because that is the first verse of the Qur'an, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And so when Adam alayhi salam said this, Allah responded to him by saying, Yarhamuk Allah ya Adam. Allah have mercy on you, O Adam. And of course, uh, we say this to this day when somebody sneezes and we respond, Alhamdulillah, Yarhamuk Allah. But what is again so symbolic is that uh, the first statements that were uttered by the divine towards man, the first utterances uh, for, for our worldview, because Allah Azza wa Jal is eternal obviously, and He's above, uh, yani He does not operate in, in, in our time, he, has, uh, he is in His own. We don't, we don't constrain Allah with our world, but from our worldview, the first speech that any human was spoken with from the divine was, Allah have mercy on you. And this shows us the default when it comes to Allah's relationship with us is Rahmah. The default when it comes to our relationship with Him is praise. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. We praise Allah. And that's our default state. We pray, we praise, we do dhikr. And the default in return, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ Allah's Rahmah encompasses everything. يَرْحَمُكَ Allah Ya Adam. And of course, uh, there are many evidences in the Quran and Sunnah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Adam directly. And this is important to pause here and go into a little bit of detail because the fact is the majority of prophets did not have this honor. To be spoken to by Allah directly is of the highest honors. In Surah Al-Baqarah, 
Allah Azza wa Jal says in verse 252, 253, Tilka rusulu ala These are the prophets, we preferred some of them over others. Minhum man kallam Allah. Some of them Allah spoke to. So the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that some prophets were chosen over others, and then right after that he goes, and some Allah spoke to, indicates that Allah speaking to the prophets directly is of the highest honors that can be given to any prophet. It is of the highest honors that can be given to any prophet. And as far as we know, as far as we know, there are three prophets that we can confirm that Allah spoke to directly. Adam alayhi salam, Musa, when Allah spoke to him on Turi Sayna, and our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when he went up to the journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. All other communications, as far as we know, were via the medium of the Prophet, uh, sorry, via the medium of the angels, and through the intermediary of Jibreel alayhi salam. All other communication was indirect. But for Allah to speak directly to a prophet, and by directly we mean there's no angel conveying the message. It does not mean that they saw Allah. No, Allah Azza wa Jal clearly mentions in the end of Surah Shura that uh, Allah may speak from behind a veil, behind a hijab. Allah does not uh, speak to the creation in this life directly. That is something that will be blessed uh, inshallah ta'ala in the next life may Allah make us amongst those uh, people. So Adam was one of the three that we know that Allah spoke to and and we can add here that it appears that from what we know Allah spoke to Adam the most out of all of the prophets because the Prophet Musa alayhi salam it was once in Turi Sayna. Our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam it was in the Isra wal Mi'raj. And as for our father Adam being the first human Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to him multiple times. And this is a blessing and a fadila and a speciality that no other prophet, as far as we know, has been given. And there are many places in the Quran that mention this notion or this fact of Allah speaking to our father Adam. For example, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 31, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا And Allah taught Adam the names of everything. and. Uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah as well, uh, that uh, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal said to Adam, uh, "Uskun anta wa qulna," and Allah said, "Yani ya Adam, O Adam, uskun anta wa zawjuk al jannah." You and your wife, you live in jannah. And when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, caused them to enter Jannah, Allah spoke to them again. And Allah said, as in Surah Taha, verse 117, We said, O Adam, this is an enemy. Iblis is your enemy, your enemy and your wife's enemy. So make sure he does not misguide you. And so once again, Allah is speaking to Adam and Allah is telling Adam, Iblis is your enemy. And uh, in Surah Baqarah as well, verse 37, فَتَلَقَّى آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ Adam received from his Lord phrases. And that phrase was, رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِنْ لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُنَّا مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Adam received from his Lord certain phrases. And because of this, Adam repented and Allah accepted his repentance. And of course, we also have Allah speaking to Adam when Allah commands Adam to come down to this earth. Say, go down onto this earth. Go down onto this earth. The two of you, uh, uh, Iblis and Adam, are going to be enemies to one another. So these are all verses that indicate a speciality of our father Adam alayhi salam, and that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to uh, Adam. And of course, we also have uh, in the ahadith a number of such traditions, of them I already mentioned one of them, that Allah speaking to Adam, Yarhamuk Allah. And there's actually an even a more lengthy hadith, um, which is in Bukhari and Muslim, which also mentions conversations that are taking place between Allah and Adam alayhi salam. And so uh, in one hadith reported by Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, خَلَقَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ آدَمَ عَلَىٰ صُورَتِهِ طُولُهُ سِتُّونَ ذِرَاعًا Allah created Adam in his image 
and his height was 60 cubits. We will discuss these phrases later on. What does it mean, his image? What does it mean, his height was 60 cubits? We'll discuss all of this. Right now, we're, we're interested in the speech section. And فَلَمَّ خَلَقَهُ After he created him, he said, go and say salam to those angels. And there was a group of angels sitting there. And listen to their response. For this salam and the response, it shall be your greeting between you and others and the greetings of your children after you. So Allah is teaching Adam to say Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. And Allah is telling Adam, learn the response from the angels. And when you learn that response, memorize it. It shall be your mechanism of greeting and responding to the greeting. And it shall also be the mechanism of your children and your progeny after you. And so Adam alayhi salam went to the angels and he said, Assalamu alaykum. That's it, Assalamu alaykum. And they responded, Wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullah. They added. And this indicates that it is preferred when somebody greets you to greet them with an even better greeting. As Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذَا حُيِّيتُمْ بِتَحِيَّةٍ فَحَيُّوا بِأَحْسَنَ مِنْهَا أَوْ رُدُّوهَا When you are greeted with a greeting, then respond with an even better greeting, or at least respond with the same uh, greeting. So the malaika responded with وَعَلَيْكُمُ السَّلَامُ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهُ And then Abu Hurairah said, and so the, that the Prophet said, and so whoever enters Jannah, will be in the form of Adam, 60 cubits tall, and the creation has continued to diminish in size until now. And we'll discuss these phrases, inshallah, uh, in, in a while, inshallah ta'ala. The point being, the notion of Allah speaking to Adam is very clear, uh, that Allah taught Adam to say, Assalamu alaikum. And we actually even have yet other ahadith that mention Allah's direct speech to Adam. And this is the incident which is narrated in the Sunnah that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, this hadith is in Tirmidhi and Muslim Muhammad and others, that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that, that uh, when Allah Azza wa created Adam, uh, he breathed the spirit, all of it goes on. Now we, we talked about the sneezing and the response. Then this version goes on and uh, it says, then Allah said to him, keeping both of his hands closed, and both of Allah's hands are right hands. Choose which of them that you want. And so Adam chose Allah's right hand, and then the hadith says, and both of Allah's hands are right hands. Uh, we'll explain all of this, because again, the symbolism, the metaphor, the interpretation, it is very vast and diverse, and we're gonna come there, inshallah um, ta'ala. And so he chose the right hand, and Allah, both of his hands are right, according to the hadith. Uh, and what does it mean? All of this we're gonna come to, inshallah. Then Allah opened uh, the hand, and it contained Adam and all, and some of his descendants. And Adam said, Ya Rabb, who are these people? And Allah said, these are your children. These are your descendants, your dhuriyya, these are your progeny. And Adam saw above the forehead of every single person, the period of life that was written on the forehead. And amongst them was a man whose light was very bright. So there's a light emanating and there's also numbers or there's a, a, a way of so showing how many years this person will live. So Adam alayhi salam said, my Lord, who is that? And Allah said, this is your descendant, Dawood. He is of the very last of nations. And I have recorded for him a period of life for 40 years, 40 years. So Adam said, Ya Rabb, give him more. And Allah said, this is what is his record. This is his qadr, this is his nasib. He has been given 40. And so Adam said, Ya Rabb, I will gift him 60 of my years. Give him 100. I will give him 60 of my years. And Allah said, that is your wish. As you, if you want, you will, that's yours, you, your decision. You, you wanna give 60 of yours, then, the, then as you wish, I will give, I will give, I will give Dawood 60. And 
Allah Azza wa Jal then says he lived as long as, sorry, the Prophet says the hadith, that Adam lived in Jannah as long as Allah wished him to live, then he came back down to this earth and Adam was reckoning for himself uh, his number of years. He knew how long he would have to live because Allah told him. When the angel of death came, Adam said, you have come before your time. Allah has gifted me a thousand years. And the angel said, yes, but you were the one who gave 60 to your descendant Dawood. The Prophet said, but Adam jahada, he denied or negated this. And his descendants as well deny and negate things. And he forgot, he, it's not as if he's lying, he genuinely just, that was not something that happened so long ago, whatnot. he forgot and his descendants also uh, forget. Okay, so uh, this hadith is in Tirmidhi and other books of hadith and it's very, very interesting. And again, you know, brothers and sisters, like, you know, these uh, hadith and the verses of the Quran pertaining to Adam, they are so many that we cannot, we, we cannot go into every tangent. We will do them. And uh, I'm getting some feedback and comments, by the way, about the lecture that uh, many people, mashallah, are really enjoying it. And a few people are somewhat irritated that I'm going into so much detail and they would rather that I summarize. And to them I say, I understand um, your uh, frustration. You would much rather that we do a, a shorter series, uh, but I have decided for this particular series to uh, follow the methodology of my seerah and others that I have done, which is an exhaustive inshallah, it's fairly exhaustive as I keep on saying, intermediate, intermediate to advanced. And so I will not be summarizing anything. That's not the point here. What I do hope inshallah, and I say this to all of you that are watching, that inshallah this material, I hope inshallah is of benefit. It is original, it is original research, meaning I'm not following one book. That's what I mean, I'm going back to the sources, I'm thinking through things myself. And I hope inshallah, those of you that are watching, you can summarize it for a younger audience. Take it for the teenagers, or take some benefits from here and there, or summarize it in different ways. That's your job. And that's, I, I, I wish you all the best. Ask Allah to bless and give you barakah. But I feel that uh, this series should be as comprehensive and therefore we will be going into all of these different tangents. So all of these hadith that I'm mentioning, inshallah, we will discuss them when their time comes and extrapolate other benefits uh, from them. So for now, we're just talking about that one issue of Allah speaking to Adam. And so we're talking about all of these incidents that we know of. And so what I'm trying to say is that it is very clear from the Quran and from the Sunnah that Allah Azza wa Jal spoke directly to Adam multiple times. And this is a speciality and blessing that only, uh, as far as we know, Adam was given. And we also have uh, at least one or two more times mentioned in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, this is the extraction of Adam's children and the famous covenant that took place between Adam and his children and between Allah. When Allah said in the Quran, Alastu bi Rabbikum, am I not your Lord? Am I not your Lord? And Allah therefore spoke directly to Adam as a human and the rest of us as souls. And we responded back, yes, we affirm that you are our uh, Lord. And all of this is confirmed in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reported by Tabarani ibn Hibban when somebody asked, O Messenger of Allah, was Adam a prophet? Was Adam a prophet? To which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responded, Naam mukallama. Yes, he was one whom Allah spoke to. Now this hadith again is very profound. Why mention mukallam? Why mention mukallam? Because mukallam means he spoke to him. Because by mentioning Mukallam, our Prophet is indicating that the rank and the status of Adam alayhi salam is much higher than many other Prophets because Allah spoke to him directly. So it is a blessing and a speciality given to our father Adam that others were not uh, given. Now, one of the most significant verses in this regard is the verse, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا This is Surah Baqarah, verse 31 to uh, uh, 33 onwards. That Allah says, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا Now, this verse occurs before the verse that says to the angels to bow down to Adam. Therefore, it is logical and plausible and realistic, and it is chronological if you read the verses, to claim that the first thing that Allah did after creating Adam alayhi salam was to teach him the names. Before the angels bowed down, 
before even he told Adam, live in your wife in Jannah, and before even creating Hawa, Allah taught Adam, وَعَلَّمَ Adam, وَعَلَّمَ Adam الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا Now, Allah taught Adam the names of everything. What does it mean, the names of everything? We have so many opinions, and if you go to the books of Tafsir, you find lots of minor, you know, lots of opinions, but they really can be summarized into two broad camps. The first is that a lot of ulama said he taught Adam the names, the proper names of specific categories of people. So, one opinion says he taught Adam the name of all of the angels. Another opinion says he taught Adam the name of all of his children. Okay, so Adam was taught, meaning he knew, and Allah gave him the name of all of his children. Uh, another position says that he was taught the names of the animals and the names of the uh, birds. So this opinion is saying that he was taught the proper names. So and so is Jibreel, this is Mikael, this is Israfil. Okay, the names of human beings, this is Dawood, this is Suleiman, this is uh, Yunus, all the enemy, and you would be in that list as well. So that is one genre of opinions. The other genre of opinions is that Allah Azza wa Jal taught Adam the nouns of everything, not the proper names, the nouns of everything. And this means Allah taught Adam speech. So this is a bird and this is a tree. Now, when we say Allama Adam, we should not think that this is like kindergarten or high school where the teacher is teaching. This is Allah implanting this knowledge. How and what is beyond our, we don't think how. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving a gift to Adam. And that gift was the gift of knowledge and the gift of speech. Now, when I say knowledge and speech, it's a very key point. We'll come back to this point, inshallah. I, don't, I want to just go into this verse here. So, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا Allah taught Adam how to speak. The names of everything means nouns. And from nouns, we get adjectives, and especially in the Arabic language, right? In the Arabic language, everything is connected together, right? So adjectives, nouns, adverbs, they all come from the same three-letter root, and this is the case with all Semitic uh, languages. And this is the opinion of Ibn Abbas and Sa'id ibn Jubayr and Qatada, also in later scholars, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Kathir, they say that Allah taught Adam how to speak uh, by teaching him the names of all of the existing species and basically the gift of uh, speech. And this meaning, is confirmed in the Quran quite explicitly. Ar-Rahman allama al-Quran khalaq al-insan allamahu al-bayan. Allah created man and Allah taught him khalaq al-insan and allamahu he taught him Allah taught him the gift of speech is a divine and personal gift from Allah to our father Adam. And then not just speech, Allah did not say Allamahu al-Kalam. Allah said Allamahu al-Bayan. And Bayan is the pinnacle of speech. It is eloquent speech. It is speech with profound meaning. That is what Bayan is. Now, what language was this? What language did Allah teach Adam? And here we, can, we come to again, you know, what, what I said, it was a two or three lessons ago, you can look, at the, look this up, that we find a, a disconnect sometimes between, uh, you know, some of our earlier great ulama, may Allah uh, have mercy on them, and we would not be here without their knowledge, we would not be able to delve into these matters if they hadn't taken us all that way. Uh, but again, their understanding of language was very different, and if you go back to the books of Tafsir, you find like 10 different opinions of all the languages in the world, right? Obviously, the majority of, of people who commented on this, not everybody commented, the majority of people who commented, uh, they said that Allah must have taught Adam Arabic, and the language of Adam was Arabic. And they say, clearly it was Arabic because Adam is speaking in Arabic, and Allah is speaking in Arabic to Adam in the Quran, is very clear. And they say Arabic is the best of all languages, and they say the Quran was revealed in Arabic, and they say the Prophet is an Arab, and therefore Adam must have been speaking Arabic. Uh, many other scholars say it was Hebrew, and others say it was Aramaic, and others say it was Syriac, 
And you have even, you know, some of the scholars, especially from Khurasan region, they say, no, the original language was Farisi. You know, that's the original language that goes there. And you know, the, 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 the fact of the matter is that all of these opinions are demonstrably uh, incorrect insofar as these languages, whether they're Farsi, Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, Syriac, we can now prove definitively that they evolved over time until they reached a pinnacle at a certain time frame, and then they moved on and dis disintegrated into other uh, languages. The fact that Allah uh, is speaking to Adam in Arabic in the Quran is actually because the Quran is in Arabic, not that Allah spoke Arabic to Adam. And we know this because Allah describes the dialogue of Musa and Fir'aun. And Musa and Fir'aun are not speaking Arabic. They're speaking ancient Coptic, or they're speaking whatever language was spoken. We don't even know, you know, the language of hieroglyphics, whatever that is, that's what they're speaking. And Allah is saying that, وَقَالَ فِرْعَوْنُ, right? وَقَالَ Musa. And this is in Arabic. And this clearly shows that when speech is conveyed in another language that means the same as the first language, you can say qala, so and so said and convey it. It does not have to be in quotation marks. You may convey the meaning of a speech and it shall constitute the speech. You may convey the meaning of the speech even in a different language. And you may say, so and so said, and then you say it in a different language. And if you convey the meaning, you have conveyed what the person has uh, said. And in fact, this also explains, you know, those that say, well, the Quran says that uh, Allah spoke to Adam in Arabic. No, the Quran doesn't say that. The Quran is in Arabic. And therefore, when Allah is revealing the Quran, everything in it is in Arabic. And therefore, the dialogues are in Arabic between all the prophets, Yusuf and his father, Arabic, Musa and Fir'aun, you know, in Arabic, Sulaiman and, and Bilqis and, 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 uh, in Arabic. But they're not speaking Arabic in their lifetimes, yet the Quran is saying in Arabic because the Quran is in Arabic and because it is allowed to convey the original speech in a different language as long as the meanings are maintained. And this also explains uh, the discrepancies uh, or the differences between the various Quranic stories that sometimes different words are used and the incident is only one. So for example, the uh, the magician say to Fir'aun, قَالُوا أَإِنَّ لَنَا لَأَجْرًا versus in another verse, إِنَّ لَنَا لَأَجْرًا You know, they couldn't have said both of them, like they're, they're basically, they said this or that. Uh, when when Iblis is questioned, in one verse, مَا مَنَعَكَ أَن تَسْجُدْ In the other verse, مَا لَكَ أَلَّا تَكُنْ مَعَ السَّاجِدِينَ So in one verse he's being asked the verb, why didn't you prostrate? In the other verse he's being asked the noun, why weren't you of those who prostrated? And it's the same meaning. I mean, it's not uh, th that big of a deal. So when you narrate by meaning, uh, you, uh, and the original intent is there, you have narrated and fulfilled. And this is something very clear. So I say this because uh, this notion of the Adamic language is Arabic, because uh, uh, Allah is speaking Arabic to Adam, no. Allah is not speaking Arabic to Adam in the Quran. The Quran is in Arabic. The Quran does not say Adam was spoken to in Arabic. The Quran is simply describing what happened in Arabic. So to assume it is Arabic, I'm asking you, would you assume that Fir'aun spoke Arabic, Musa spoke Arabic, all of these other prophets spoke Arabic? They clearly did not. They had their own languages. And I already mentioned uh, two or three lessons ago as well, that we are now fairly confident about positing the development of languages and the origin of languages uh, and the theory of how language develops. And I, I, this is not the time or the place, nor is it my area of expertise to summarize what we now definitively know. But it is almost basically definitive. It is almost to the level of yaqeen that uh, all languages of the world are interconnected and that any two languages, they have a tree that goes back to uh, an original language and they're now clusters of languages as I said. And all of these clusters, uh, they go back four, five, six thousand years. Those clusters then have uh, previous clusters before them until there must have been an original language of man. This is what modern linguists who don't believe in Allah, don't believe in the Quran, modern linguists, when they examine the roots of languages and the structure of languages, the predominant theory is that there must have been one mother language from which all of the proto-clusters came. These proto-clusters are uh, um, proto-Indo-European and, uh, um, and uh, Afro-Asiatic and others that are clusters if you like. And from them we now get all of these different uh, languages. Now, this is very interesting for us because, so basically the point being, what was the language of Adam? We don't know and we cannot reconstruct it. It is gone.
Because the point that we now know, languages do not remain stagnant. No language remains stagnant. Languages evolve and they slowly split up and they become different languages, right? So if you know your Romance languages, you know, France and Spanish uh, and, and Latin and English, they're all related, but they just slowly just uh, changed. And if you understand even English, for example, how people speak English in Jamaica or in Scotland, right? These are from for our Native American ears, almost incomprehensible and yet from their perspectives it is English. It has become slightly different. No language remains stagnant, even Arabic. Nobody speaks the Arabic of the Quraysh anymore. It is gone from the face of this earth. It is preserved in the Quran. It is preserved, you know, in, but it is not spoken anymore. And the same goes for the Adamic language. It is now gone. What it was, we will not know in this world. And if we uh, are curious, then inshallah in Jannah, we will ask our father Adam and we will learn some more things about linguistics. Now, I wanna now pause here. I've already spoken a little bit about this and um, uh, for those readers who are, uh, listeners who are interested, inshallah, I'm, I know you're finding this very interesting. For those who find language and li li linguistics boring, I apologize, but um, I personally find this very interesting and that's why I do think it is very important to simply pause here for a few minutes before we move on. And that is that I believe one of the most amazing passages about the creation of Adam involves this verse, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا And the reason for this is that the mystery of the origin of languages is one of the biggest unsolved mysteries in the field of science. If you know the ongoing discussion and debates, and if you look at especially the discussions of linguists and evolutionary biologists, there are certain things that puzzle them and which they have no answer for. And one of the biggest mysteries is that of language. Because language is so unique to human beings. Think about it. The fact that we can communicate the most abstract of ideas and that we can communicate an infinite number of concepts, like no two people are gonna speak exactly the same, even if they were to describe the same thing. The fact that we can discuss concepts beyond our time and space, imaginary concepts. We can talk about romantic ideals and philosophy and, and architecture and engineering. The fact that we can change what we're saying by emphasizing the nuances of our, in, in, uh, of our uh, speech and syllables. Uh, the fact that even a, a slight change in our tone conveys a whole different meaning. The fact that we can compound sense and sentences to infinite number of degrees and permutations. The fact that uh, children learn language and then can express in their own words, in their own construction. They might learn words, they will construct it on their own. It is something that is mind boggling. As for the communication of the, of the animals, as we said, it is reactionary. It is something that is stimuli provoked. They see danger, they will say danger. They see food, they will give directions to the food. The animals do not philosophize. They don't discuss abstract ideals and past histories and, and future you know, potentials. This is lost, they don't do it, that's not their world. And so evolutionary biologists, those who don't believe in God, those who don't believe in an akhir, don't, don't believe in the Quran, they're trying to understand why only one species species, and that's us, has language to an nth degree, an infinite degree. And the closest thing to this, maybe let's say uh, gorillas or whatnot, they can barely do monosyllables or point to an object. And yes, it is true that, you know, some of these primates have been uh, conditioned uh, to see an apple and point to the word apple and whatnot. And they can, you know, and, and what, there is some correlation that is the very, not even, this is not even a three-year-old. This is even lower than that with these primates. But it is true that you can, rudimentary get some, you know, it is like uh, primates have communicated with, with uh, their researchers and whatnot, I want apple, you know, I want this. So they're able to get that message across and however they, they do that. But again, it is stimuli, I want apple, okay? That's not, it's basic, it's very basic stuff of, some, of a provoked uh, uh, word because of the stimulus of hunger. The point being, as I have said, that it does not make any sense from evolutionary biology. The wide gap that exists between Homo sapiens, Banu Adam, 
between us humans and between all of the other species. And uh, more than a hundred years ago when this science of linguistics, and as I've said previously, the science of the study of language is fairly recent. Uh, the actual study only began two, three hundred years ago, and uh, most of the, the groundbreaking research has been done only in the last 50 to 100 years because it was almost impossible for a researcher to have access to multiple languages at any given time 500 years ago. Think about it. There were no dictionaries even of your own language, by the way. Even the notion of comprehensive dictionaries in all languages is relatively new. So uh, my point being that it was only 100 years ago that people began to think, what is the origin of languages? And you know, some bizarre theories uh, were, were, were propagated, you know, and um, the names of these theories, frankly, uh, they are ridiculous. Uh, and uh, some of these names, I'm, I'm not kidding, by the way, I'm not joking, you can look this up. The Bow Wow theory, the Ding Ding theory, the La La theory, the Poo Poo theory, and these are actually actual names. Now, uh, to be fair, they were given humorous names by the researchers uh, so that you would understand the concept of the theory. So, for example, uh, one theory went that our primate ancestors picked up language by mimicking the sounds of animals. Or another theory said that they developed grunting noises while they were working in the fields. Another theory said that they're responding to pain or happiness and that becomes language. But the fact of the matter is that all of these theories are dismissed and they're only studied as antiquated history when you study linguistics. To this day, no solid theory has been propagated. I want to mention here very briefly that one of the most intriguing theories that has gained a lot of traction uh, in, la in the last 50 years has been uh, propagated by one of the most famous linguists of our times, uh, Noam Chomsky, and somebody that uh, I admire his political analysis immensely. A lot of people know, know of Noam Chomsky, but they know of him as a political analyst and as a left-wing you know, critic of American imperialism. Actually, his speciality, his PhD, and his teaching is in linguistics at MIT. And um, Noam Chomsky, over 50 years ago, he actually propagated a, a theory that has gained a lot of traction, which is that listen to this now, that after studying many, many, many languages and finding certain commonalities in languages and in the acquisition of languages in children, Chomsky said, and listen to this, that the ability to learn and to speak a language is something that is inborn and innate in a child. It is not acquired. It is something that is inside of the child. And we don't, And he said it's housed somewhere in the brain, but in reality, he doesn't know this, we know this, it's housed in the ruh. It's Allah's fitra that Allah created. Fitrat Allah lati fatra nasa alayha. But the point that, that Chomsky said after all of his research, and he is considered to be the greatest uh, linguist and the greatest scholar of languages alive today, and the conclusion that he reached is that language is something that is innate in uh, a child, and a child is born with it. And this explains, by the way, why every single child in any civilization or culture, regardless of how intelligent they might be in other aspects, when it comes to language, as long as they have a functioning you know, mental capacity, when it comes to language, every single child is fluent in his or her own way. Not as fluent as the most eloquent poets of the tribe, but every child. You know, some children struggle with mathematics, some children struggle with art, some children, but when it comes to language, when it comes to speech, if a person is mentally normal, every single person acquires the ability to convey their ideas and they construct sentences beyond what they have heard. If they learn 5, 10, 20 words, they're able to construct sentences on their own. It's something that is innate, nobody taught them. Also, uh, we notice, and Chomsky also points this out, that children have a unique capacity to learn when their minds are blank, when they have no other knowledge, when they're toddlers, they acquire this knowledge without being taught how to acquire, they acquire. Nobody teaches them how to be taught and how to learn. They simply absorb and they begin, begin uh, speaking. And yet that same child, when reaches 10, it becomes much more difficult. 20, quite difficult. 30, almost impossible to learn a language, even if they are super smart in other fields. So something is, something is very interesting here, and that is that children appear to have a natural gift a natural tendency to be able to absorb the capacity to learn and to be able to then implement and speak on their own. Now, what am I doing talking about all of this stuff? Because 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, the one thing he gifted Adam that he did not gift any other creature. وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا That is unique to us. There are creatures that are stronger than us, faster than us. There are creatures that can fly, we cannot fly. But Allah gifted Adam with something that is unique and no biologist can understand or explain because it is a divine gift. And the fact that the Quran mentions وَعَلَّمَهُ bayan to me, it is one of the most profound miracles of the Quran that demonstrates the truth of this Quran and that demonstrates that Adam السلام, in particular, and we're gonna come to this point, I'm jumping in the gun, but uh, I do not believe uh, that Adam السلام, uh, was descendant of other species as uh, the theory of evolution claims, and we're gonna come to this point. I do not believe this. I believe that Allah created Adam and that Adam السلام, came down to this earth as a unique beginning, that Adam did not have a mother or father. Adam was not born a biological birth. Adam was different from the rest of the species that were already here. Now, how can we prove this? Scientifically, we cannot. However, we can point to certain things that are unique. And the number one thing that is unique on our list is that of language. And that is the one thing that the Quran mentions. Here's my point. Modern science has told us that the most miraculous thing about man is language. Modern science finds it a mystery of language and where language originates from. And yet the Quran is telling us out of all of the things Allah could have mentioned, and the Quran is telling us the most unique thing about Adam is Adam's speech. That's why I believe it is a very interesting correlation. Now, one final point before we conclude for today, and that is that a lot of people believe that uh, the unique cap uh, capacity that Adam was given was the capacity of aql, of intellect. And this is not incorrect, but it is not absolutely correct either. Let me explain. It is not incorrect because Adam السلام, and his progeny, that's us, we have a level of intelligence and of thought and of rationality and of cognition and of metacognition. We have a level of intellectual acumen that no other species around us has. And because of this, even though the animals are stronger than us, we can control the animals. And even though the you know, other animals might have skills and whatnot that we do not have, because we have intelligence, we have dominion over them. Now, why then doesn't the Quran mention aql, that Allah gave Adam the aql? Here's the point. Bayan incorporates aql. You cannot have aql, sorry, you cannot have bayan without aql, without intellect. But you can have intellect without, without bayan. How so? There are people whom Allah has tested, they cannot speak. They cannot speak. And yet their minds are super genius. They have rationalities, they have, you know, famous physicists and whatnot. They had some of the sharpest minds we know of in our generation, but they could not speak. So, you can have an intelligent mind, but not be able to communicate. But to communicate effectively, fluently, powerfully, to communicate eloquently, you cannot have bayan without having a rational and intelligent mind before it. And that is why when Allah says عَلَّمَهُ bayan, Allah taught Adam eloquent speech, included in bayan is rationality and higher intellect and cognition and metacognition. You cannot have bayan without that. And that is why it's interesting once again that what is mentioned is uh, the faculty of eloquent speech because it automatically has, it's buy one get one free. You, you literally are talking about the final product, but there are stages before that must also be there. And the stage before that must be there is the stage of the, of the intellect. So when Allah mentions عَلَّمَ آدَمَ asma, and when Allah mentions عَلَّمَهُ bayan, automatically included one of the unique characteristics of our father Adam that Iblis did not have, that the angels do not have the way we do, and that no other species has is that of rationality and thought. And this is in fact demonstrated in the first verb, عَلَّمَ 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 Adam عَلَّمَهُ bayan. You can only teach the being that has intelligence. And the more intelligence, the more he can be taught. 
And so when Allah teaches Adam speech, so then Adam's intelligence and rationality must be to a totally different level. In any case, I went into a lot of detail uh, because I really find this to be very intriguing and I hope that inshallah you understand where I'm uh, coming from here. And we still have to talk about one other aspect, uh, maybe maybe next lecture, maybe the one after that we'll see. Uh, uh, and I know a lot of you are asking questions about this, about what do we do with the theory of evolution and what do we do with what we know of Adam alayhi salam's timeline and the timeline of mankind. That's a very big question because uh, our books mention uh, and a number of other faith traditions like the Jewish calendar mention that Adam existed 6,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago. And yet we have the remnants of civilizations, you know, 10,000 years ago. And we have paintings that go back, uh, mankind's paintings that go back documented 50,000 years. And we have the bones the bones of, of, of mankind, of homo, of homo sapiens. We have the bones that might date back two, three hundred years, four hundred thousand years, two, three hundred thousand years, sorry, four, two hundred, three hundred thousand 300,000 years. Some even say half a million years. And then before this, we have other species that are not quite, um, that, that are not quite um, human. So how do we reconcile this notion of Adam being uh, 6,000 years old, as some people say, versus human civilization clearly being at least 15, 20, 30, 50, 80,000 years old. How do you reconcile this? That's another big question. And inshallah, we're gonna come to it uh, soon, bi ta'ala, uh, but my time is up today. Uh, inshallah, until next time, jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. لقد كان في قصصهم عبرة لأولي الألباب ما كان حديثا يفترى ولكن تصديق الذي بين يديه وتفصيل كل شيء وهدى وهدى ورحمة لقوم يؤمنون